Hello, my name is Uta Wee. I'm from IHE Delft Institute for Water Education in the Netherlands, and I'm presenting to you on co-designing purpose-driven citizen science based on our experience in a number of projects in Europe and in Africa. So why do we need to consider co-designing citizen science? Citizen science comes in many shapes and sizes. It's a multi-stakeholder phenomenon with multiple dimensions and clearly involves more stakeholders typically than just citizens and scientists alone. All of them have their own motivations and expectations for why they get involved in citizen science. And all too often we see that these expe expectations are not being met. To address these difficulties, here we argue that a co-design approach is uh, required that allows us to pay closer attention to the process of how we implement citizen science. That allows us to carefully uh, combine social, technological and operational dimensions of citizen science. So co-designing citizen science, how can we actually do this? Well, how long is a piece of string? There are many ways of co-designing. At one end of the scale, we might say we invite a couple of stakeholders to a workshop and call that co-design. On the other hand, we would argue that it's really important uh, that we carefully think about the process, the way in which we do the co-design, and that it requires more than a one-off consultation. So we would argue to, for the need to follow a sound approach that's culturally sensitive uh, and also feasible with different resources and different capabilities. So we would like to offer an approach that's tried and tested and validated to work in different settings. And we developed such an approach in the Ground Truth 2.0 project. We developed, uh, tested and validated uh, co-design methodology. At the heart of it is a carefully guided and uh, supported iterative process with uh, stakeholders that takes them through a series of what we can call interaction moments uh, that allows us to really come to an understanding of both the individual and their collective needs and allows these stakeholders to evolve uh, uh, towards a joint purpose and goal for their citizen science initiative, which alongside is enabled and facilitated by suitable and tailored ICT-based tools um, so that their initiative can have uh, agreed and sustainable impact. The Groundless methodology uh, resulted in guidelines for sustainable citizen observatories. It was validated in uh, seven demonstration cases and is adaptable to uh, different geographical contexts, social settings, and thematic issues. At the heart of this is also the understanding that we're not just co-creating data and knowledge, but fundamentally we're also changing relationships, stakeholder interactions. And to make that more tangible, we've developed a typology of stakeholder interactions that uh, the co-design helps us understand what kind of category of stakeholder interaction uh, in any particular setting are they actually aiming for. On the one hand, are they interested in environmental monitoring, mostly drawing on implicit, implicit data collection by citizens, or is it perhaps a more advanced form of cooperative planning with uh, deeper stakeholder engagement, including consultation, feedback, and discussions? Or uh, it more, more advanced is the environmental stewardship form of stakeholder interactions with a fully realized dialogue and shared responsibility for natural resource management. Overlapping for all of them, of course, is the joint monitoring scheme involving citizens in monitoring uh, the environment. But the uh, typology is helpful as, as the, the backbone, a conceptual backbone uh, for the co-design methodology because it helps us to identify what are the agreed and intended purposes of the data and knowledge that they are co-creating. The co-design me methodology then uh, consists of a number of phases and stage, it has a stage gauge approach uh, based on fundamental underlying principles. But uh, in, in a nutshell, it on the one hand consists of the co-design of the purpose of what, what are we all here for, what is this citizen science initiative about and why is it helpful even for us to, to be engaging in citizen science to achieve uh, agreed purposes. On the other hand, it helps us also to uh, co-design the technical components often relying on existing open source uh, technologies 
and tools, but making sure that these are really uh, selected carefully and then tailored to the specific needs uh, of the stakeholders. Alongside of this, uh, crucially, is the, uh, are the efforts to foster a true community amongst these stakeholders uh, that run the citizen science initiative and take this over in the long run. So as I said, we've uh, tried and tested this approach uh, in Europe and Africa. In the Ground Truth project, we did so in six countries, uh, allowing them to, fo to uh, focus on different topics and work at different scales, but using a one unifying approach. Now, you might notice the term citizen observatories popping up here. This is a particular form of citizen science initiative, very popular in, in Europe, uh, certainly in the last 10 years or so, uh, which focuses on the one hand on the environmental monitoring and, and governance involvement uh, of citizens. It's place-based, uh, usually involves ICTs and, and, and sensors to observe the environment. Uh, but it, it crucially has this very close link with policy and policymakers from the very start with a focus on influencing decision making. So we implemented our methodology in, in these six different countries, resulting in distinctly different observatories, all with their own identity, but overall um, showing, illustrating that they belong, let's say, to the Grand Truth family of citizen observatories. And importantly, the methodology allowed them to focus on the thematic issue, on the environmental challenges most prevalent in their local environment. So we see that the African case is very much focused on community-based uh, sustainable natural resource management in Zambia and balancing livelihoods and biodiversity management in Kenya. In Sweden, uh, the local community wanted to focus on water quality and how they can engage in water quality management. In Spain, uh, by means of uh, phenology, preparing for climate change, in the Netherlands looking at water quantity and moving towards uh, climate-proof weather and climate water management. And finally, in Belgium, uh, focus on environmental quality of life, particularly air quality. And in terms of uh, co-designed stakeholder interactions, each of these different uh, citizen observatories also plays their individual focus here. Uh, where we see that there is a whole range uh, in, in our typology that they picked as the preferred uh, stakeholder interactions. Now, the Grand Truth methodology, co-design methodology as such, is, uh, is very comprehensive and allows the co-design of uh, uh, comprehensive uh, IT infrastructure that allows citizen authorities to exist uh, in the long run, in the long term. But we've also... Uh, uh, um, evolved the co-design methodology and called it a co-design methodology light uh, with, a, with a lesser emphasis on the IT infrastructure but nevertheless allowing stakeholders, local stakeholders to uh, develop meaningful citizen science, purpose-driven citizen science initiatives in their own settings, in the, uh, particularly in the MIX project. Uh, we have done so in three of the five case studies uh, in Hungary, Romania uh, and Italy. And there we've used this methodologies to help stakeholders either use citizen science to make the case for nature-based solutions in their local setting or to uh, come up with a monitoring scheme to, monitor, to measure the impact of the nature-based solution that have already been implemented. So uh, I would like to briefly conclude by reflecting on what actually comes into play when co-designing citizen science with local stakeholders for a common purpose. On the one hand, uh, it, it depends on how we ourselves as facilitator of such processes think about uh, citizen science. What is That's the starting point, point for, for the co-design that happens. So it's important not to push a particular concept or a particular technology, but really creating value for the stakeholders by understanding uh, their needs and motivations to, uh, to be involved in citizen science. So that really means that we have to come to the table with a blank page as far as the purpose and the scope of the Future Citizen Science Initiative uh, is concerned. That's not always easy. Often citizen science projects are funded uh, with a certain agenda, but nevertheless, from, from a true co-design perspective, that would be ideal as facilitators. We can be as neutral as possible and making a conversation among stakeholders uh, possible. So... Um, as far as uh, ambitions of uh, social change 
collective action, uh, buy-in, a behavior change are concerned. We could even argue that co-design is not only an option, but it's it's a necessity to really bring about those uh, those changes. In terms of the the purpose and the shape uh, of the citizen science initiatives, we saw in these case studies that that is not. Uh, uh, um, only initially defined, but it's actually evolving understanding uh, throughout the co-design session. So uh, one of consultation clearly isn't enough. We really need to make sure we have an iterative process. People are learning together, not only collecting data together, but they're learning together um, how, how they can jointly create uh, meaningful citizen science uh, initiatives. And it also means that we have to think carefully of how we can provide balanced co-design. What are the roles of the stakeholders, uh, their contributions in this process? What are the controls and, and the roles of the facilitators? And, and to what extent do these shift over time? The value of co-design is also important to realize that this is not something that uh, is only generated at the end of the co-design process, if you like. So once a uh, fully-fledged citizen science initiative is up and running, tools and technologies are being used, uh, um, monitoring schemes are being uh, implemented in the field, but the value of the co-design really starts uh, from the very beginning, as soon as the co-design process uh, uh, is set out. Uh, stakeholder relationships are fostered, people make connections that previously they haven't had, um, and it really provides the seed for a social movement and uh, space for, for social learning. The community building dimension that we have stressed in our methodology we find is as important as co-designing apps and platforms and, and tools we really need to foster a sustainable community of relevant actors uh, that are uh, working together in tandem with the co-design of uh, tools uh, and technologies to make sure that overall they can reach the, the goals and the purposes that they have uh, agreed on. And finally, uh, the, flex the methodology needs to be flexible, uh, but of course also consistent, so it's providing this balance. Uh, and we find that the ground truth methodology has allowed us to provide um, the, the flexibility to be feasible uh, and adjustable in terms of scopes and benefits uh, uh, per community, and to uh, adjust and adapt these to different geographical settings, social settings, and thematic issues. So while I would like to thank you for your attention, I would like to also draw your attention to uh, further information that's available on the Brown Truth website and also the MIX website. And the full Brown Truth methodology will be available in a forthcoming paper. Um, and the guidance for the Brown Truth methodology light uh, will be available on the MIX platform and also in the form of the paper. Thank you so much for your attention, and I look forward to the discussion.